Hello. So Monday I put out a video where I talked about Luke Skywalker and some of my own personal headcanon that I think best suits the Disney sequel trilogy. So today, I'm going to go through several points which I think would help Disney get their feet planted and actually make the Star Wars franchise good again. So let's begin. How would I fix Disney's Star Wars? Well, first off, The Mandalorian is a really good start. It has drawn in the fans. This is kind of where Disney needs to lay some more focus. They can continue on with some of the ideas that they have. There has been talk of an Obi-Wan Kenobi series. Which, if based off the book, could be good. The only way it works is if they get Ewan McGregor to come in and play Obi-Wan again. If they can't get him, then don't do it. There has been talk of other spinoff series, which I'm not too enthralled about. Maybe they could work, but I really wouldn't focus on pushing those. So, that would be number one. Number two. They need to wait at least five years from now to release any more movies. And they need to stop focusing on movies that take place between episodes three and four. They could maybe get away with an episode or a series of movies that takes place sometime between Return of the Jedi and The Force Awakens. But that time frame should kind of be left a little bit alone. Keep that in the live action TV shows. There's really no need to make a movie about that. Now, where I would really fix Disney Star Wars is in their expanded content, the expanded universe, the new one, not Legends, although some of the stuff could take from Legends, and it would go simply like this. I would make probably a series of video games. Or books. Now the first thing that pops into my mind as a writer. Is a series of books. And where these books would start. Would actually be. Between Empire Strikes Back. And Return of the Jedi. And this book would actually follow the Emperor. It would start with the Emperor having a vision of basically the events that actually transpire on the second Death Star. And he starts thinking of ways to circumvent the outcome. We know the Emperor has the ability to see the future and hide himself from the Jedi. Now, these are two points that need to be made very clear, and you need to remember going into this book series. So, he's preparing, getting the second Death Star ready, and he wants it done fast. He thinks if it gets done quicker, and it's operational, he can move quicker. But he's not stupid. And we actually discover... That he has known about Exegol for an extremely long time. In fact, Exegol is like his summer home. 
he takes off and goes there, and we actually learn more about the entire planet. That the entire planet is a race of people completely subservient to the Sith. That they are basically the Sith cultists that they were labeled in Episode 9, but we didn't really see too much. Now, everybody was asking when Episode 9 came out, who built all those Star Destroyers? Um, clearly the people who live on Exegol. You know, Earth has over 7 billion people on it. And, true, while the surface of Exegol did not look really hospitable, who's to say this race didn't learn to live underground? They could be, I mean, if other races could live in harsh environments, like, you got entire cities that live on Tatooine, which is a completely desert planet, I'm pretty sure this race found a way to live underground. And because they lived underground, they had lots of resources. Maybe the Emperor was shipping in resources. There was a Thrawn book where materials were being mined and Thrawn was trying to track them down just to find out it was being funneled into building the Death Star. Spoiler if you haven't read that book, by the way. <laughs> but moving on. So, Emperor Palpatine keeps making frequent visits. And here we could get kind of another character. Like his true second-in-command on Exegol. Vader was his public you know, I don't know what you want to call in that case. If the Emperor was president, then Vader was vice president. But this group of people was the shadow company waiting to take over in case things failed. That was one thing about Palpatine. He had backup plans for backup plans. So anyways, through the first book, you go through some of the events of Re Return of the Jedi, and halfway through the book, you get to the big fight scene at the end. Only, we see the fight scene, this time from Palpatine's point of view. And everything is happening pretty much exactly as he predicted it would happen. As he saw. And Vader does betray him. And throws him over. Only he uses his powers. To cause an explosion. Sending him flying into the wall. Near a door. And he quickly escapes. Into a hallway. Now this is not outside his character. Completely in the realm of possibilities. If you rewatch Return of the Jedi, there are several doorways and walkways down that shaft he was falling. And if he caused an explosion, it would send something up. Remember, it took a while for the Death Star 2 to blow up. So, he gets out into the main corridor, he pulls out a communicator, signals. For help. His royal red guards come rushing up along with those guys in blue. And he informs them that Vader has betrayed him and they he needs medical attention. So they get him to the nearest shuttle, get him off the Death Star, and on board the closest Star Destroyer. After that, we see his new second in command say Let's go. And they peace out. Which is why after the Death... Right before the Death Star blows up, and right after, you don't see any Star Destroyers. Because the remaining Star Destroyers, they got the hell out of Dodge. And this new second-in-command, he's the one who takes this small fleet of Star Destroyers to Exegol. So from there... 
Oh yeah, by the way, there would also be set up that he hid the holocron, or the Sith Wayfinder, sorry, on the second Death Star. Because he felt one day his new apprentice, the one that would surpass Vader, would need to find it to come find him. Basically, he had a vision of Rey. He didn't know it was Rey. He didn't know what she would bring to the table. But he had a vision. And it was through that the reason why he hit it on the second Death Star. Then, as we get into the second book of this series, we see the Emperor being patched up, healed on Exegol. He's informed that their scientist might have found a way to compress the Death Star laser. To shrink it down to a smaller size. This is where he comes up with the idea that each new Star Destroyer should be equipped with its own Death Star laser. They had already been toying with this. He even had the Empire working on it. And some of the best Empire scientists were actually pre-sent to Exegol for this reason to work with the Sith cultists to ensure this actually happened. He wanted this the entire time. He wanted to make sure the galaxy was under his thumb and that no one would oppose him. Because while the Death Star was powerful, it was too slow. And he wanted a fleet. And the Death Star was going to be just a big target. While the smaller Death Stars, or Star Destroyers, went and did the job he wanted it to. So, from there, we start seeing basically what Palpatine was doing up to over those years. We watch him create a clone. Like I said in my previous video, this clone would be crafted from the DNA of himself because he saw himself as a very powerful Sith with extreme abilities over his powers and the only other person in the galaxy who even came close in his eyes, Anakin Skywalker. With their DNA combined, it would give him a new vessel that would be even more powerful than himself. And if the cloners he had on Exegol as maybe prisoners actually pulled this off, they could endlessly make him clones that he didn't have to worry about death. Now there would be a big twist to this, which I'll get into a little later. So we see through many failed attempts that the cloners just keep having issues until finally they managed to succeed. And the, and the clone that they make is so powerful, so disruptive, it nearly kills them all. It takes many of the cultists doing unspeakable things to actually get this clone under control. And basically what the cloners do is they create a device that they inject into the clone to suppress and break the connection with the force because it was so powerful and dangerous. Palpatine wasn't sure at this point if he had come up with a good idea that it might just be too powerful. 
but the device slowly starts to fail on the clone. And the clone actually is able to overcome it now and then to actually break free. Eventually, he steals the ship, flies off. He's chased by the Emperor's people. But, sadly, he's shot down over a nearby planet. When he crash lands on this planet, he ends up being saved and brought into a village. There he finds a woman who he ends up falling in love with. They end up getting married. Now, he's very good at hiding himself in the Force, just the same way that Palpatine was good at hiding himself. Which is why Palpatine can't figure out where this clone of his is. And if anyone discovers this clone, it's going to ruin everything. It's going to tell the galaxy he's still alive. Because the fact that the galaxy believes he's dead is allowing him the time he needs to really focus and build the Empire 2.0. So the clone ends up, like I said, married. And him and his wife are going to have a child. Now, at this exact same time, we learn that Leia and Han are also expecting a child. The parents of the child receive a visitor. And it turns out that while the father could hide himself in the Force, the ch unborn child was very visible. And immediately, Luke recognizes the clone of Palpatine, but he just, he just doesn't look quite right. He's seen videos of Palpatine through the years from old archived footage. This doesn't look exactly like Palpatine. In fact, he kind of looks like his father a little bit. And he starts to wonder. But the clone says he is the son of Palpatine. Luke doesn't know how this is possible. But before Luke can inquire even more, the clone takes off with his pregnant wife. And on the day the child is born, Luke and Palpatine both feel this tremendous echo through the Force that ripples through the galaxy. Something had just happened that scared both of them because they did not understand what was this. I mean, it was a bigger echo for Jedis and Sith Bigger than the destruction of Alderaan. Something very powerful had just happened. And we, as the readers, will learn that this is because both Ben Solo and Rey, which she'll probably get an actual name, were born at the exact same time. Which is what makes them a triad in the Force. Which is why they are connected. Because two new Skywalkers were brought into the galaxy at the same time. Not where, like, Luke was born second and Leia was born first. No, they came in the exact same time, at the exact same minute, at the exact same second. And they were both extremely powerful. They both had ties to the powerful Skywalker gene. So, Luke goes searching for them again. And, meanwhile, the Emperor, he locates a bounty hunter. And he thinks that his clone might have something to do with it. And he gives his clone a device that might help him track down and locate 
his clone. Which turns out to work. And he tracks the clone down, ends up killing both the clone and the clone's wife. The, you know, person who was helping him hide. But he didn't know about Ray. We had already watched the clone pass Ray on to the guy on Jakku. Sorry, I had to think of the name. Some of these names are still very new to me. Um, so she's already been left on Jakku in his care. And we end this book series with Palpatine finding out that his clone is dead. And the, they're still working on trying to make him a reasonable clone that will work for a body. And the best they can come up with is this one that's like a puppet. That's made from random DNA samples that were combined with his own. Because after the failed attempt of trying to fuse his DNA with Anakin's DNA... He didn't want to take a risk that something like that might cause a bigger problem. So he thought, hey, what if we try with other alien DNA? So I would have advantages in my new body. And that's where we would basically end it. With the creation of Snoke. And him going into a constant meditative state to control Snoke. And work on building up the First Order. Finding remnants of the Empire and building it up. I would also probably touch base in the books about Operation Cinder and how as soon as he got the medical attention that got him somewhat back on his feet that he enacted Operation Cinder from Exegol. That way that would be cleared up and everybody can now know about it. If you didn't play Battlefronts 2. Um, after that, I would probably make a game that would, uh, I don't know, probably involve some of what I talked about, but from Luke's point of view or from a new Jedi's point of view. I would also probably make a game that dealt heavily with the Jedi and focused on Luke's temple before it fell and how Kylo Ren was slowly being seduced into the dark side. I think that would be interesting. Um, but then finally, like I said, five years from now, if they did this, then they could do a trilogy of movies that take place during the time of the Old Republic, in which we find out all about Darth Bane. And Darth Bane's story of how he created how he created the rule of two and how he learned a way and the point of creating the rule of two was to be able to transfer his soul into another living body. But it could only be done by somebody who opened themselves up to the dark side. Someone who was embraced in the dark side at the moment of his death. So anyone who killed him had to be... It didn't matter if you were good. It didn't matter if you were always on the dark side. If you were on the dark side or even open to the dark side at the moment you killed him, meaning you were doing it out of hatred and anger, that would open up the door so he could put his soul into you. And we learn that he has been doing this in an epilogue of that movie. We would discover... That he has done this many times. Which basically we get several lines of dialogue that show 
that Palpatine, from the word go, from episode one, was always never really Palpatine, but Darth Bane in Palpatine's body. This way, it sets up the ultimate villain. A villain who's been around forever. And he's been living by going from one body to another, to another, to another. Which is why when Rey kills him in the final of episode 9, she's not doing it out of anger. She's not doing it out of hatred. So she's not open to the dark side. She's completely on the light side of the Force. And he can't put his soul into her. A lot of people have said, well, if Luke had killed Palpatine, it wouldn't have been evil. But Luke wasn't thinking that way. Luke was being taunted by Palpatine. He was being manipulated. He was being pushed, even for the briefest second, to open up to the dark side. He's done that many times. Which is why Vader knew. Vader felt it. And he even felt it. And he had to say, wait, no, <laughs> I can't do this. That's why he throws his lightsaber away. The Emperor's coming down to face him. And, and what did he do? He threw his lightsaber aside. Wait, that's not in Luke's character. Oh, yes, it is. Because he did it. He threw it aside instead of using it to kill the Emperor. Because he knew that the Emperor was going to keep trying to manipulate him. He was trying to get him to open up to the dark side. See, people do not understand Star Wars, yet they want to criticize it. So that's why I say, the new movies are not bad. Yes, I have my problems with them. They are not perfect. At all. None of the Star Wars movies are honestly perfect. Hell, when you think about it, the Empire is actually the good guys. You think I'm crazy for saying that? Think about it. The Republic, they had no military police. They had no police force at all. They actually went asking the Jedi to help them if there was a war. True, it was a war that Palpatine started. I mean, he was playing chess against himself. So, of course, he was going to win either way. He had been, he had set up the perfect chess game. It's easy to win when you're playing both sides masterfully. But he always wanted that side to win. Once he had his pieces in place. So they had no police force. And this is what drives me nuts about the prequels when people say they do not like all the political talk. You know what? That political talk is very important. It's called Star Wars. For a reason. Wars are usually, normally, fought mainly because of political reasons. So, they had no police force. They had no control, which was shown by the Trade Federation blockading Naboo. And the Jedi flat out said, we are not a police force, we are not going to help you. We'll, help, we'll maybe come in and help a little bit. But you got to find some people to actually do the job you need them to do. You need to find a police force. And then they go, oh, well, actually, you know what? There's a there's a bunch of clones being made just for this reason. Somebody already put that order in a long time ago. What a convenience. So the Republic finally used the clone troopers. And sure enough, it was all employed by Palpatine to basically build a police force, which he would turn into the Empire. Now, after he became Emperor and took over, he used this police force to basically make the Republic what it should have always been. The Empire was everywhere. The Empire was doing the job that the Republic didn't do. And it did it in a pretty good job. Yeah, you had corrupt people, but, I mean, that's any politics. Any government is going to have some corrupt people. You can't stop it. 
But ultimately, they provided jobs, they provided security, and I believe Palpatine said it himself. In order to ensure the security and continuing stability, the Republic will be reorganized into the first galactic empire for a safe and secure so, I mean, yeah, basically the empire was a good thing. It was exactly what the go their government needed because the Jedi weren't going to keep staying involved. The Jedi weren't the police of the galaxy. In fact, if it didn't concern the Jedi, the Jedi weren't concerned about it. So, I mean, the Empire provided. Provided what the Republic couldn't. And then terrorists basically came up and fought against the established government. And the established government fell very poorly, I mean, really all they did was take down two bases. I mean, it would take a lot more than taking out two of our bases to destroy our government. I mean, you'd have to completely overthrow the entire, you know, Capitol Hill. And I bet that if we were actually invaded, Capitol Hill would be way more defended, which means... Coruscant should have been way more defended than any other planet in the galaxy, being that's where the Emperor probably spent most of his time. But anyways, moving on. So, the Empire falls. And the New Republic is born. And they maybe learned a little bit Watching The Mandalorian, it doesn't seem like the Republic did a very good job at keeping the peace the way the Empire was. I mean, we just saw Season 2, Episode 1, which basically said the second the Empire was out of the picture, things went to shit. Things went way downhill really fast. And I'm referring to these... This mining company coming in and taking over this small, tiny town. And if it was happening in a small, tiny towns like that, then don't you think it was happening in other places across the galaxy? Criminals were on the uprise. Hell, if Jabba the Hutt was getting away with what he did in the time of the Empire's rule, don't you think other criminals said, Hey, the Empire's gone. I can expand. I can take some of what they had. In fact, that's probably where those mining company people came from. They're like, oh, hey, <laughs> my big uh, competitor is out of the picture. I'm going to go take over. Clearly, obviously, the Republic didn't come in and help that town. No, it took one guy from that town standing up and driving them off. And he was constantly working at it. So if it was like that for one town, it was probably like that for others. And it was probably not a good time. We saw once where the Republic actually came in and did something. But other than that, I don't think the Republic got involved unless it was something big or heavily illegal. And they were actually tipped off about it. Because the galaxy is a big place. So lots of room to hide. But that leads me into another thing Disney could do to fix Star Wars. Recently there has been a release of a new video game for Star Wars. Star Wars Squadrons. I'm going to go out and say that I'm a big fan of the Angry Joe show. And I can't wait to pick up this Squadrons game. 
Angry Joe has also done reviews of much of the Star Wars content. From the Mandalorian to the, every video game that usually comes out. And he keeps making this one statement that there should be a Rogue Squadron type live action show. And you know what? Yes, there should. They should definitely do that. That would be awesome. That would be great. In fact, you could put that during the time after Return of the Jedi to the time of Episode 7, where we follow a Republic squadron, and this squadron is based near the Outer Rim, and they're slowly, you know, they're going about missions, and then suddenly they start hearing about this, you know, new enemy that's trying to get a foothold in the galaxy. And it turns out that this could be the start of the First Order. We could see how the First Order got a foothold and what they went through. And I think that that would pretty much be great for the first season. Just kind of leak that in, that it's the First Order. I mean, you could have them go on other missions, do other things. They don't have to just go against the First Order. You could have them hunting down remnants of the Empire, taking on smugglers, dealing with uh, traitors in their midst who used to be, you know, people of the Empire who got away and lied their way into the New Republic. I mean, you could do all sorts of stuff. It would, Like Angry Joe said, it would basically be Top Gun in space. And we don't need the Jedi. We don't need more of that. I mean, yeah, you could bring in a Jedi maybe once in a very blue moon. We do not need a baby Yoda. Which, that really irritates me because he is not a baby. They call him the child, but he's not even a child. He's 50 years old. Clearly his race deals with mastering the Force before they even deal with talking. He may look like a toddler, but he's 50. I mean, that would make him generally an adult, an older adult, in human years. So, he's not a baby. He's not even, maybe even Yoda. I know there's some speculations as to his origins, but we'll find out in The Mandalorian. But, a Squadrons type live action show would be awesome, and that would work for definite sure. They... They could even tie it into characters. Like, it could be Poe Dameron's great-grandfather or, you know, father serving at this place. And we can see how he meets his wife and they get married. You know, there's a ton of stuff they can do with this. Or maybe it's Poe Dameron's father and he's shipped out shortly after Poe was born. I'm not heavily into the character of Poe Dameron, so I don't know the character's entire backstory, but we, even if he's, you know, someone else, we could always have that character, the main character, connected somehow. Poe Dameron's uncle. Where did he get all his flying abilities? Well, his uncle. And maybe his uncle is the one who actually devises and we see him having to do that light skipping, which, if you know Star Wars, shouldn't be a thing. But technology is always improving. So maybe he's the one who develops the technique on how to do it. And the first and pretty much only person he ever teaches it to is 
Poe Dameron. And that's why the First Order was able to keep up with Poe when he did it, because they got fooled by it once. So they were able to not just also use that information to create a tracking device that could track someone through hyperspace, which is supposed to be impossible, but they actually learned how to do it themselves. So these are my ideas that I think could be used to fix Disney Star Wars. If you know someone from Disney, please point them towards this video. If you have a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend who works for Disney's higher-ups, send them here. Have them watch this. I promise you, Disney, this would fix Star Wars. Stop making mistakes. Stop saying things that are stupid. Because since Rise of Skywalker has come out, people keep having questions. And Disney, you keep saying the dumbest things. Calling Pal this Palpatine from Episode 9 a clone is dumb. It makes a lot more sense that he survived Return of the Jedi than this being a clone. Like, a million times more sense when you're actually familiar with the canon. If Darth Maul can survive getting sliced in half... If Boba Fett, from the expanded universe, which is now Legends, can survive getting eaten by a Sarlacc, which, you know what, I don't know why people are so surprised, because that has always been a thing since, like, the 90s. I remember it was, I believe the book was Tales of the Bounty Hunter. And where Bubba Fett actually explains that he killed it from the inside, blasted his way out. I mean, it was right there. It's in the Legends universe. So I don't know why people are coming up with these stupid, weird theories of, how did he survive? Well, because he never died. He wasn't even injured when he was thrown in the Sarlacc pit. The idea was that Luke, Han, and Chewie were all going to be tied up. And they weren't going to have any weapons or anything that could help save them from being digested by the Sarlacc. Boba Fett, not only was he alive... He had no injuries. He had weapons on him. He was not tied up. He had a helmet, which probably kept his air filtered, so he didn't breathe in any poisonous gas from the fumes of the stomach, if he even made it that far down. It takes a while for your... When you eat food, it, it doesn't go straight down into your stomach. It doesn't just drop in there. It takes a little while to go through your esophagus. So if you want to say that, you know... A, he was probably only a few feet into the esophagus at the time. You know, and that's what really blows my mind, too. You know, fans of the f freaking Star Wars series, you need to give it a break. You okay? You need to relax. You need to chill out. I've already I've yelled at Disney. Now I'm going to yell at you. You need to stop. Because you want to know who's ruining Star Wars? You're just as guilty. And I'm not going to hold back. Because I have been hearing people complain and whine about this and that since the mid-90s. Stop. You complain about Leia? How could she survive space? You know what? George Lucas put a freaking worm in an asteroid. 
a living creature in space. Nobody whined and complained. No, actually, Empire Strikes Back is considered one of the best Star Wars movies ever. And then I asked people, well, why? Because the bad guys won. That was so crazy. Really? They won. What'd they win? Please, in the comments, I want you to tell me what the Empire won. The Rebels got away in the first 40 minutes of the movie. Vader did not even chase the Rebels down. No, he chased down Han and Leia. Luke wasn't even with them. Luke was on his way to Dagobah. You could say that he knew Leia was on board and maybe they wanted to capture the one of the higher-ups of the Rebellion, but capturing Leia would not have stopped the Rebellion at all. And she clearly was never going to give up any information. Vader was wasting his time chasing them. The Rebels, they got away. Yeah, the good guys got away. Han? Han got captured? Who was Han in the Rebellion? He wasn't some pivotal force. Like, capturing him did not stop the Rebellion. No, in fact, the Rebellion kept on after Han was captured. They managed to capture a shuttle, which they were planning to go and use to bring down the second Death Star. If Han hadn't showed up, they would have gotten somebody else to go on that mission. So, they did not win by capturing the bad guys or stopping the rebels, which was kind of the entire point of what the Empire was going there to do, was to end the Rebel Alliance. They had the Rebel Alliance on their run, and then they slipped past them. The Rebels got away. Vader cut off Luke's hand, but Luke got a new hand before the credits rolled. So, no long-term damage there. Um, yeah, he lost his lightsaber, but he got a new one. And that's the other thing, too. I would add into the books, a lot of people keep bringing up the lightsaber. Is I would also make the lightsaber a cursed object by Palpatine. Like, we would actually see him have a memory of while they were working on turning Anakin into Vader, he was working on cursing the lightsaber. Or, wait, no. Okay, strike that, forget that. He didn't have the lightsaber at that time, that's right. No, so shortly after he turned to the dark side, we watch him take the lightsaber behind Anakin's back, curse it, because he wants to, I don't know, he lies about something, makes up something. I mean, I'm not, I don't have this fully planned out in every detail yet until Disney decides they want to come pay me to write this, in which case I'll be more than happy to do. But, I mean, he does something to the lightsaber, and that's why it's so tied to the Skywalker family. Why it recognizes the strongest person. Like, the way Excalibur recognized King Arthur. Yes, I'm very big into the Excalibur lore. I love the lore of Excalibur and King Arthur and... Merlin and Knights of the Round Table. So, yeah, I would definitely have something like that in the books, too. And it would all fit, and it would all piece together. But, no, I mean, going back to what I was saying, the Empire did not win in Empire Strikes Back. Honestly, Vader's very lucky that the Emperor didn't kill him. Because, if you notice... Vader actually kills more 
people then probably then died in the rebellion. I mean, he went through at least three officers. I think that was a big sign that he was slowly trying to destroy the Empire from the inside. And the fact he basically convinced the Emperor not to kill Luke to turn him instead. I think was also another big hint. So, no. If you can, if you can think of a way that the Empire won, please put it in the comments below. I'd love to hear I'd love to hear your thoughts. If you would like to read a good book series that has no flaws, and I know that's very big to say, but I go through my books quite extensively, and I have tied everything into a neat little package. So, if you want a good book series, today is Wednesday. There's only a few days left. Go to Amazon, get books one and two of my book series, The Guardian of Light. Angry Joe, if you watch this, if any YouTuber that likes Star Wars watches this video, check out my book series. I think you will love The Guardian of Light. It is the perfect way to start off the Christmas season. So by me telling you that, it's already a big hint of what you might find. But, it is very fantasy-based, set in our world today, with a story that will make any adult feel young again. I want to thank everybody for watching. I have enjoyed telling you how I would fix Star Wars. And please, stop trying to ruin it. Everybody, Disney fans... All of you guys, stop it. You know, every time you argue over this, the SJWs, the woke people, they win. When you refuse to watch a movie of it, you're letting them win. I don't care about anything outside the movies. I don't care what Ryan Johnson said. I look at what he said, and I'm like, well, when you're sitting there trashing his movie that he and a hundred other people worked really hard to bring you, and you're going to trash it, I can understand why he's getting angry. When you're sending stupid death threats to actors because you couldn't comprehend how he brought it to life. That's kind of sad. Don't you think? I mean, I watched the fallout of Last of Us 2. And the things I heard was just... Oh my god, completely unbelievable. Yet, I actually watched YouTubers show this stuff on YouTube. And it's like, have people lost their minds? Can you not separate reality from fiction? Jeremy from The Quartering had, did a ton of videos. Clownfish TV did a ton of videos. Where they talked about this stuff. And it's like, oh my god. It's a freaking movie. And I'll tell you what. Star Wars doesn't push the SJW agenda nearly as much as Marvel does. And how Marvel is pushing it even more so. I was so cringed. When I saw Endgame, I already wasn't, I'm going to go out and say I was not huge into Endgame just because I basically knew how it was going to end because I had followed 
some of the extra stuff going on outside the movies. And that's why I said, honestly, nowadays, you need to stop. You need to stop worrying about what's going on outside the movies, what the actors or people are saying. If you want to be spoiled and get everything spoiled for you, then by all means, keep doing it. You won't be surprised. It will be no fun to watch the movie, and you will have no interest. And... Yeah, basically just do that. I don't watch Star Wars and think, oh, that's what this person outside the movie said. So I have to hate this now. People got so upset with Solo because they called Lando Calrissian pansexual. You know what? I didn't see any of that in the movie. I saw a guy who cared about his robot that had incredibly valuable information. But you know what? I've also seen people that care a lot about their cars. More than they care about other people. So. I'm going to go. I want to thank you for watching. I want to thank you for taking this time to hear my thoughts. And hopefully, if you do know someone from Disney, you will share this video with them. Tell them, hey, look, this guy's got some really good ideas. Get him and this other guy. Bring them on board. Let's fix Disney. Because Disney, that's the only way you're probably going to make any money anytime soon. Because you are ruining everything else. You know, they have this saying called, go woke, go broke. You know, that's not a joke. That really happens. You're seeing it now. It's happening to you right now. Now you can keep going that way. The more you go that way, the more you push that, the more you are going to lose out. And you're going to drive everybody away. And then you'll be really sad. And, I mean, you can keep pandering to other audiences besides, you know, the audience you had, the audience that's right here. Basically, put a muzzle on some of your people. Don't let out information. Don't let people say bad things. I mean, I understand it. I, I get, you know how hurt these directors are when people trash talk movies that a hundred or more people worked on that have their names in the credits besides just that one person. But that one person is being called out. That one person is spearheaded as the main person. Ryan Johnson, everybody looks at The Last Jedi and they think Ryan Johnson and Kathleen Kennedy. They don't think about anybody else who is involved with making that movie. Just those two. They're the ones responsible. They're the ones who messed it up. And that's sad. Because there are so many other people that worked on that movie. And you're hating a movie that people worked their asses off to bring you. So... I want to thank you all for watching. If you like this, please subscribe. I doubt anybody will like this because, you know, well, I know how the climate is nowadays. This is probably going to be my most disliked video of all time. I want to thank you for watching. Happy writing.